Thank you very much for coming. I'm Professor Paul Cartledge. I'm the president of the Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies, or the Hellenic Society, or HELSOC, as we tend to refer to it. So any of you who don't know what the society is, you're shortly going to be given a little introduction to it by our executive secretary, Dr. Fiona Hara. But before she speaks, I'm just briefly going to tell you the shape of this evening's entertainment. Of course, it will be instructive as well as entertaining, but we hope you will go away feeling you've had a good evening. So we're going to start with Fiona's introduction. I then will introduce our two stars, um, the main speakers of the evening. And then I shall hand over first to Sir Michael Llewellyn Smith, and then he will in turn hand over to uh, Professor Roderick Roddy Beaton. They will then have a little bit of a, well, it might be, might it, more than just a dialogue. I mean, at least there will be some kind of interaction between them. And then the... Uh, issue of this evening, which is from the Paris Peace Conference to the Treaty of Lausanne, 1919 to 1923, that subject, their contributions, will be thrown over to the Theatron, as the ancient Greeks called an audience. Collectively, you are Theatai, and the abstract noun is Theatron. So I'm now going to hand over first Fiona. Good evening, everyone. As most of you know, um, I'm Fiona Hara. I'm the secretary of the Hellenic Society. Um, and I wanted to say welcome to you all. I know that many of you are not members of the Hellenic Society. Um, so um, I just wanted to start with just a little introduction about the society um, so that you um, understand the kinds of things that we do. And in case you may even want to become members yourselves, um, so the society was founded back in 1879 um, and we do a number of activities. We publish a range of journals, organising events. We jointly own the library um, along with the Roman Society and the Institute of Classical Studies, which is based in Senate House in Bloomsbury. And we support schools, summer schools, research projects with grants, and we offer an undergraduate essay prize. If you do decide to become a member, um, you can choose for, to receive um, a combination of a range of journals that we produce. Um, the um, well-known Journal of Hellenic Studies, um, founded in, back in 1881, the first publications of the Society, um, archaeological reports, um, and our more recent publication, um, our glossy magazine Argo, we produce uh, this twice a year. If you become a member, you can choose from a combination of these journals or you can subscribe to Argo just on its own without becoming a member. Tonight I've brought with me, um, and they're at the back of the room, a few, um, a few of these Argos that, you, um, that we're selling at a discount tonight. Um, so if you'd like to buy a copy of Argo, um, you can find me um, at the drinks at the, at the end of the evening. <coughs> And of, of our um, activities are our um, wide-ranging events programme that we run throughout the year, a mixture of lectures, conferences and visits. Um, I put up um, a few of our um, forthcoming events, obviously tonight's events with Michael and Roddy. In February, we will be hosting Polly Lowe from the University of Durham, who will be giving a lecture here at the Hellenic Centre on Imperial, uh, Athenian imperialism. <coughs> In March, we will be holding, along with the Roman Society, a colloquium on changing attitudes to the Olympic Games, including a number of speakers, um, including our president, Paul Cartledge, will be speaking at that. Um, in June, after our AGM, we will be having a colloquium on AI and the future of Hellenic studies. And our next 
event, our next visit will be to West Norwood Cemetery that we'll be doing um, at the end of April. Another strand of our activities is our involvement um, of the um, library um, at Senate House, which we own along with the Roman Society and the Institute of Classical Studies. Um, if you become a member, you're very welcome to use the library to borrow books, to benefit from our postal loan system. Um, the librarians will also help you with anything that you need. Um, and are very good at sending you scans of articles and papers if you're not able to come into London to visit the library. On the other side of the slide, I put up a page from our Hellenic and Roman website. We, a few years ago, we launched a major fundraising campaign for the library, um, which we've been running for a few years now. Um, you'll find on your seats um, a flyer about tonight's event, but also with some additional information about the library and also any ways, some ways in which you could help to support the library um, and give a donation. You'll see that there's a link to the website um, and a QR code if you're interested in helping to support this. So if you need any further information, um, it's all available on our website. Um, you can follow us on X. Um, I, have brought, um, I have brought some applications, some membership forms. Um, they are um, available at the back of the room, some flyers about how to join the society. But obviously, um, do ask me if you'd like any further information. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's event, um, and I'll hand back to Paul. Just a few words of thanks. First to the director of the Hellenic Centre, our hosts this evening, Naya Yakumaki. Then, of course, to Fiona, without whom nothing that uh, happens under the auspices or the aegis of the Hellenic Society happens. And then our two speakers. So the subject of tonight's discussion is two diplomatic agreements concluded in the Swiss town of Lausanne 100 years ago in 1923. Diplomatic agreements which drastically changed the lives of millions of people on Europe's southeastern borders and very largely established the boundaries of today's Greece and Turkey. And we are exceptionally fortunate in having to speak to us this evening two genuine experts. First of all, Sir Michael Llewellyn Smith. He is a retired British diplomat and unusually both diplomat and academic. He served as ambassador to Poland from 1991 to 96, and even more relevantly for us, Ambassador to Greece from 1996 to 1999. And he is currently a visiting professor at the Centre for Hellenic Studies of King's College London. He has published um, several works, but I mentioned just two. Ionian Vision, Greece in Asia Minor, 1919 to 1922, originally published in 1973, exactly 50 years ago, rather neatly bisecting the Treaty of Lausanne and today. But much more recently, he has written the first part of his biography of one of Greece's elder statesmen, intimately, perhaps too intimately involved in the events leading up to the Treaty of Lausanne, namely Eleftherios Venizelos, of Cretan origin. Our other speaker is Professor Roderick Roddy Beaton. He is a retired academic, though I'm not sure that I see much evidence of uh, retirement. He was Korais Professor of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature at King's College London for 30 years, three decades, 1988 to 2018. 
But if you look a little bit further along his bio, you'll find that uh, he graduated from the other university from Michael. Michael was an Oxonian, indeed a graduate of the same college that I myself attended, a uh, new college. Whereas Roddy was educated at Peterhouse, Cambridge's oldest uh, college, and graduated with a degree in English literature. Yes, now this came as news to me. I assumed he must have done it somewhere along the line, uh, modern Greek studies, or at any rate, modern Greek history. His um, knowledge of Greece and of Greek is extraordinary, and he is an honorary citizen of the modern state of Greece. Written many, many books on Byron, for example, the making of modern Greece, but there are a couple, perhaps, that are more relevant than others. The Greek Revolution of 1821 and its global significance lying behind what we're going to be hearing about tonight. And same year, 2021, the Greeks, a global history. And before that, Greece, biography of a modern nation. So between the two of them, I think they cover all the relevant bases. And it's with great pleasure I hand over to Michael to kick proceedings off. In advance, thanks to Roddy Beaton also, I should say that if I make some odd noises, they're because I have had a cough. I've recovered from it, I hope, but, you know, it may come back at unexpected times. Um, I'm going to go back a bit, a bit further than the date which was mentioned, I think, by Paul, uh, of the Paris Peace Conference, which was 1919, because it's difficult to understand what I'm talking about unless one goes back as far as 1914 or 15. So that's what I'm going to do. And I start with the famous letter sent by Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary in the British government, to Prime Minister Venizelos, offering, quote, important concessions on the coast of Asia Minor if Greece would come into the war and help to save the Serbs from destruction by the Austrian army which presumably was awfully arrayed. I thought you would have recognized that one. <laughs> the Austro-Hungarians reckoned to punish Serbia for the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Gray's offer, or bribe, to put it in cruder terms, was aimed primarily at Venizelos who he knew was very interested in Smyrna and in Asia Minor. But it was also aimed at King Constantine. So why did Britain make this offer? The answer, because Gray knew that Venizelos' eye was fixed on Smyrna and that he would be tempted. Moreover, Asia Minor was realistically the only bait that could be offered there were arguments against any possible alternative. The Straits, excluded by Russia, or the Dodecanese, recently occupied by Italy. Cyprus was British, so it was obviously out of bounds, and Venizelos recognized this. And Gray knew that Asia Minor would be a great temptation for him. But as Venizelos recognized, he was not the only object of this offer. The King Constantine had to be persuaded that uh, Asia Minor was a feasible object, a feasible object of Greek ambition. And Venizelos set about this in discussion with Constantine. Those involved on one side were Venizelos, wanting to join the Entente powers of Britain, France, and Russia, basically. And more or less, 
Venizelos on his own. Of course, he had a following. He had a large majority in parliament. But he was the driving force uh, and nobody could uh, take his place in, in these discussions. On the other side, King Constantine, the foreign minister, George Strait, who was convinced that neutrality was the right policy in the Great War for Greece, and the general staff, the military figures, such as Colonel Metaxas, a familiar name because later on he became uh, president uh, of, of Greece. A formidable team who, despite the king's hesitation, ended by ruling out Asia Minor. So Venizelos had to think of other ways to get Greece into the alliance, the Entente. Now, why and how did Britain get into the business of offering territory of another sovereign state, Turkey, to Greece? Well, Turkey was about to become an enemy state. So it was fair game, I suppose, in the rush and the chaos of war. These matters seemed distant and unguessable. Who could tell what was going to happen in a great war? The point was to make an offer to Greece which would bring them in on the side of Britain. And Britain would then follow it up as best she could later. And that was how, in the stress of wartime, great powers and lesser powers operated. Dog eats dog, as it were. The offer came to nothing because it was blocked by the king and his advisers. Metaxas delivered the death blow to Venizelos' further proposal that Greece should help the Entente conquer the Dardanelles and thus open the way through the Straits to Constantinople, Istanbul. But as the war proceeded, Asia Minor was not forgotten, not forgotten by the Greeks and not forgotten by uh, the other countries uh, of the Balkans. This was the time when the Turks were launching uh, what the Greeks call a theogmos, a, a, a brutal attack on uh, on the pockets of and, and more than pockets of Greek inhabitants, Greek speaking and Greek religious inhabitants of the Asia Minor littoral, and um, Asia Minor was number one on Venizelos' list of demands when it came to the Paris Peace Conference at the end of the war in 1919. So by a rather roundabout uh, way, I've brought you to the point which occurs in the title of this, um, this event, the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. Venizelos had Lloyd George on his side by then. Lloyd George was one of the dominating figures, if not the dominating figure, at the conference. And I think you know, know or you will know soon, if you don't know, what was about to happen. Uh, you'll hear from me again later, but for the time being, I'm going to hand over to Roddy Beaton. Okay, well, first of all, I too would like to um, thank Paul for those kind words of, uh, of introduction. I'd like to thank the Hellenic Society, that's Paul, that's Fiona, and its honorary secretary, Leslie Fitton, for uh, uh, thinking up this, uh, this evening and uh, inviting uh, Sir Michael and myself to speak. And um, 
Michael is most elegantly uh, sketched in the, the early part of the, uh, of the, of the story. Um, and with some trepidation, I'm going to pick it up really th through the, um, the, the talking about the role of Eleutherius Venizelos. I say with some trepidation because I am, of course, partnered here with the biographer of yeah. Venizelos. And I think it's, uh, it's rather sporting of uh, Michael to uh, allow me to... Uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Take the the, the 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 floor at this uh, at this point. Um, on the other hand, the uh, the second volume of the biography of Venizelos is as yet awaited. So I think it's perhaps entirely fair that Michael might wish to keep his own powder dry. Anyway, um, I was also that was most uh, the most elegant uh, account of the events up to 1919. I was slightly hoping, Michael, you would go a little bit further because what I've got to say is more a kind of evaluation of what happened later than actually telling the story. So if if you feel there are gaps afterwards, do please don't don't be don't be shy, and uh, one or other of us um, will do our best to fill in those gaps. But. I want to focus on this on this man, and we're starting off um, <clears throat> with the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. And what I want to focus on is what Venizelos was trying to achieve in 1919 and 1920 with the pol policies and initiatives that led Greece to an invader, in effect, an invasion of Asia Minor, or Western Anatolia, um, in 1919 and 1920. The policies that would then lead to defeat and disaster for Greece in 1922. That was the, uh, the event known in Greece as the, um, as the Asia Minor <clears throat> disaster, the Greco-Turkish War of 1919 to 1922 that was <clears throat> finally wrapped up. It led to, the first of all, the Convention of Lausanne in January 1923, and then the Treaty of Lausanne was the final agreement that uh, resolved uh, many things, including the frontiers of both countries, more or less as they are today. And in parenthesis, this is perhaps a moment to um, make the point that that uh, Greco-Turkish war is known in Greek as the Asia Minor campaign, and it ends with the Asia Minor disaster. The same events are remembered in Turkey as the Turkish War of Independence, and it's a remarkable fact, and fairly unusual, I think, in uh, world history, that the Greeks and the Turks have each fought a war of independence against the other. <laughs> so what I want to look at in this talk is <clears throat> how achievable were, what were Venizelos' aims, how achievable uh, could they have been, as judged with the benefit of 100 years of hindsight, and also to what extent was Venizelos himself, who was, of course, a key player both at the Paris Peace Conference and also at Lausanne in 1923, to what extent was he responsible for the outcome? Now, some of the most serious historians of the period, who are not otherwise unsympathetic to Venizelos, have established what looks increasingly like a consensus. I should have moved the slide on a moment ago. Uh, <clears throat> according, to this, according to this consensus, the root cause of the disaster in Asia, the Greek disaster in Asia Minor, lay in Venizelos' decision to accept the mandate of the Allies at Versailles, at Paris, and land troops in Smyrna in 1919. By the time of his electoral defeat a year and a half later, in November 1920, <clears throat> Venizelos, the story goes, then had compounded this error by failing to recognize the true nature of the Turkish nationalism that he was against, as he was not, it was not the rump of the Ottoman Empire that was fighting back. It was Kemal, it was Mustafa Kemal, later known as Ataturk, who of course later became, went on to become the founder of the Turkish Republic. Uh, Venizelos' plan for a new military campaign in 1921 against Kemal in the interior of Anatolia was therefore doomed from the beginning, so the argument goes. And the eventual failure of the campaign was therefore the fault of Venizelos, who had started it, even although he had lost the premiership, he had lost power in Greece, and had left Greece at the end of 1920. Uh, so that the initiative really lies with him rather than with the royalist government, uh, a government loyal to the to King Constantine, um, which replaced him at the end of 1920. 
Um, and they had then just followed through this policy to its bitter end. And anyway, according to this consensus, a Greek enclave in Western Anatolia would never have been viable. No frontier in that region would have been defensible against attack from the east by the Turks. This is, I think, more or less the, the argument of King Constantine and Metaxas and others that Michael mentioned earlier. To have cut off Smyrna from the Muslim Turkish hinterland would have made no economic sense either, it has been argued. If that, had, if, that had, if that had succeeded, within a few years of Greek rule, Smyrna would have lost all reason to, economic reason to exist. And all this has been very persuasively argued. But I'm a little bit devil, devil's advocate here. I'm, I'm suggesting these arguments all assume that the Treaty of Sèvres, which was signed by the uh, victorious powers on the outskirts of Paris on the 8th of August 1920, uh, and assigned these territories in Asia Minor to Greece, uh, this treaty was never ratified. The kind of assumption is, because it was never ratified, that kind of proves that it was inherently unworkable. And my counter, my counter suggestion is maybe that's, you know, it's not the only way to use hindsight. Just because it didn't happen, maybe that doesn't mean that it couldn't have. So let's look at what Venizelos thought he'd gained in August 1920, after the Treaty of Sèvres was signed, and shortly before his electoral defeat in November that year. The popular understanding of um, the treaty, as promoted by Venizelos and his supporters, is summed up in this famous colored map of Great Greece that was produced in 100,000 copies, I believe they were actually printed here in London, uh, within days of the signing of the treaty. This is not Lausanne we're talking about, it's Sèvres in August 1920. Colored pink are Greek territories that almost completely encircle the Aegean Sea, with a gap for an international zone around Constantinople and the Straits. That's the, shade, the, the lighter pink shading and also the darker pink on the northern side of the Sea of Marmara. <clears throat> and another in the southwest corner of Anatolia and the islands of the Dodecanese, which the treaty had assigned to Italy. In this uh, postcard, Greece personifies, holds up a placard, which reads in translation, Greece is destined to live and will live. The treaty brought into existence a new Greece, a quote, of two continents and five seas, a favorite expression used by Venizelos and his supporters. At the time of signing, all of this new Great Greece was already occupied by Greek troops, with the exception of parts of Thrace, the northern bit um, between the Aegean and the Black Sea, <coughs> and Greek troops moved in there too. In this way, the treaty awarded to the Greek state the greater part of what every Greek government had been trying to achieve since the 1840s at the very least, which was to expand the frontiers of the state so as to embrace the entire Greek nation, the whole uh, dispersed, orthodox, Greek-speaking uh, nation, uh, also known in Greek as Elinismos, the, the Greek people, the Greek culture. And just as had happened after every previous extension of those frontiers, including its initial creation during the 1820s, the assumption I don't think it's spelt out, but the assumption that under, clearly underlies this treaty was, is that it would be followed by some movements of population um, where Greeks still lived outside the state's borders, this enclave in Western Anatolia. Either those borders might uh, eventually be extended by the same diplomatic means, or people would be induced to, to, to move home. Turkish-speaking Muslims into the rump Ottoman Empire that remained in central Anatolia, Greek-speaking Christians into the Greek-controlled areas. This was, after all, what had happened following the recent Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913. And traumatic and often devastating in effect, certainly, but nothing like as destructive as the massacres which had taken place during the Greek Revolution, or indeed as those that actually took place in 1922 and 1923. What about the argument that a Greek Smyrna, over there on the Amazon enclave in Anatolia, could never have been viable, was cut off from its hinterland? 
Consider a tale of two great Ottoman cities, Smyrna and Thessaloniki. The physical setting and the economic history of both are very similar. So even was their traditional urban layout. Before each was destroyed by fire, Thessaloniki in 1917, Smyrna in 1922 in the immediate aftermath of the Greek defeat. The Greek population of Smyrna in, in, the, in uh, 1920, say, was larger, both as an absolute number and as a proportion of the total, than was the Greek population of Thessaloniki. In many ways, it, would make, it could have made more sense for Smyrna to become the Simbrotevusa, the second city of a modern Greek state, rather than, th than the Balkan city of Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki, too, has been to various degrees, just like Smyrna, has been to various degrees cut off from its hinterland since it became part of Greece in 1912. That includes the half century when the Iron Curtain that divided Europe during the Cold War ran just 50 kilometers to its north. To go back to a detail of the map I showed earlier, you see what I mean. The northern frontier at least as far as, um, uh, as the river Everos, um, quite far along the Thracian coast, that northern frontier is more or less the frontier that's been in place ever since. But Thessaloniki also was cut off from its hinterland by that frontier, and indeed much more so during the, uh, during the Cold War. Um, those frontier, that northern frontier, would prove impossible to defend on the one occasion when it was attacked by the Nazi Germans in 1941. Imagine that a Greek frontier in Western Anatolia, as shown here, ignore the shadings, that's a neutral zone, it's the dark pink um, that, is, um, uh, that, that was the, to be the Greek enclave. Imagine a Greek frontier in Western Anatolia. Suppose that had been negotiated between Venizelos and Kemal and perhaps consolidated by a much less, by a movement of populations, but one much less drastic, and certainly without the violence, that in fact took place. After all, Venizelos' diplomacy with Kemal's representative when it came to the treaty in Lausanne, the negotiations in Lausanne in 1923, um, and then with Kemal himself later in 1930, proved that Venizelos had a great pragmatic skill in negotiating a settlement in circumstances much less favorable to Greece than existed in 1920 or 1921. Ironically enough, indeed, had that happened, Greece's Anatolian province, adjacent to Turkey, which was neutral in World War II, would have ended up being the only part of Greece to escape occupation by Axis forces 20 years later. And then there's a the fateful decision to go into Anatolia at all in 1919. The key lies in the fact that Venizelos only and always went into action when he, is, when he was assured of great power backing. And Michael gives lots of telling uh, instances and evidence for that in his book, uh, Ionian, uh, Ionian Vision. And indeed, the exchange with Earl Grey that we started out with is an excellent illustration of that. Venizelos had the backing of the great powers in 1919, he also had it in 1920 when he ordered his troops to extend their zone of occupation both in Anatolia and in Thrace. He was seeking it again at the time when he fell from office at the end of 1920. But without far more robust guarantees than were available to his successors, I believe that Venizelos would never have pressed ahead with the offensives that the Greek army made in 1921 so long as Venizelos was in charge, military and diplomatic campaigns were run in tandem, each feeding into the other and each responsive to opportunities and constraints experienced by the other. Every one of Greece's military advances and diplomatic gains overseen by Venizelos between 1912 and 1920 um, <clears throat> had been made in alliance with foreign partners. In 1921 and 1922, uh, the 
the royalist Greek government was in no position. It was unable and indeed unwilling to try to restore that partnership. And that's what made the difference. The immediate cause of the Greek catastrophe in Asia Minor, therefore, was a failure of diplomacy. And a failure of diplomacy is one thing that I believe Venizelos would never have made. Even without Venizelos' diplomatic skills and without the support from abroad that he had so assiduously cultivated, it's still remarkable how close the Asia Minor campaign came to success. The Battle of the Sakarya River in August 1921, that's as far as the bulge goes, but you see how close to Ankara, uh, the Turkish then provisional capital, you see how close they got. Um, it was very nearly won by the Greeks. Defeat in Anatolia was not inevitable, even in the summer of 1921. And even without the logistical and diplomatic advantages that would have been available to Greece in the meantime, if Venizelos had retained the premiership, the supposedly doomed tactic of defeating Kemal by military force still came closer to success than is often realized. I would argue that the fundamental flaw that undermined Venizelos' entire policy is, lies not in the decision to go into Asia Minor in 1919, and not, or not only, in placing a mistaken trust in the terms of the Treaty of Sevres. Basically, it was, I mean, that was the key in hindsight, mistake. He thought because it had been signed and sealed on a bit of paper that it could be enforced. But the losing side, the Turkish side, the Ottoman side, had not signed that. And that was, that was what really opened the door to Kemal and the, the whole story of the creation of modern Turkey, which is another story. Venizelos' brilliance at negotiating with foreign statesmen wasn't matched by his political skills at home with his fellow countrymen. It was Venizelos who forced upon the country the, the national schism that was beginning to emerge in the story that Michael told us just now, when the, the country basically broke apart in civil war under the pressure of whether, whether to join with the Allies or whether to maintain the country's neutrality. They call it in Greece the ethnikos tichasmos, or national schism. Venizelos, since he was so determined to join on the one side, to join the Allies, he could, could he not, he could have worked with King Constantine and the General Star. He could perhaps have directed his genius for persuasion where it was most needed, which was also the place closest to home. I mean, that picture dates from before the, the crisis. It's, I think it's 1913, it could be 1912. Um, the king and Venizelos, but just look at the eye contact. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not there. Um, the loss of trust between these two camps seems to have come about very early on, and the consequence of that loss of trust would prove irreparable. I love this pair of images as well. The whole the whole logic of Venizelos' expansionist plan for the state was based on his Cretan outsider's perception of the Greek nation, the Greek nation beyond the relatively narrow bounds of the 19th century, of the 19th century state. If Venizelos was to get his way, he ought to have been able to sell that perception to the leaders and the populace of the old Greek state as it existed at the time but they had become used to the comfortable certainties that had grown on them since the arrival of King Otto and his Bavarian advisors back in the 1830s. So where I think Venizelos really failed was in not recognizing and giving, giving their due to the passion and sincerity of those Greeks who wished to preserve intact what they called a small, honorable Greece. Seemingly unable to understand the perspective of his opponents, Venizelos resorted to means that were the very opposite of diplomatic. Once he'd uh, concluded, uh, probably around the summer of 1915, the only way to gain his objectives was by actually overthrowing the constitutional basis for the government that he led. This is the national schism. Every step that Venizelos took <clears throat> would strengthen his hand abroad, but at the same time weaken it, weaken it fatally at home. 
The logic of his position and the fatal flaw that in the end would undermine his entire policy of national expansion was set out starkly in this proclamation issued by Venizelos in September 1916 that announced the rival, the formation of a rival provisional government in the other capital of Greece, Thessaloniki, where he said, the nation is called in the absence of the state to answer a national emergency. Whereas the state has betrayed its obligations, it remains for the nation to act in order to achieve the task assigned to the state. I think this is a key quote and I've argued this elsewhere, but I think that this whole debacle that took place in Greece during the First World War and was really at the root of the disaster of 1922, it was a conflict between the rival concepts of the Greek state as something small and concentrate, concentrated and the Greek nation as the broader understanding of the Greek people um, beyond the boundaries of that state. When it came to it, Venizelos the Cretan, the outsider to the Greek state, because Crete only became part of the Greek state in 1913, and thanks to Venizelos in many ways, the outsider to the Greek state was prepared to sacrifice the integrity of the state, or at least to risk the integrity of the state, in the interests of the wider nation. That's what King Constantine and Metaxas objected to. And this greatest of all Greek statesmen in modern times seemingly was blind to the most obvious reality of all, that his policy, his policy goals, I mean, how do you, do you make the wider nation survive? How do you defend the wider nation? Um, depending on diplomacy and foreign support, um, yes. But it also had to depend on a strong and unified state at his back. The state had to be ready to make the sacrifices demanded of it, to live up to the expectations of the allies, and to face down its enemies. Venizel was brilliant reaching out diplomatically to the foreigners. It was the people behind him were the problem. And he wasn't looking behind him when he perhaps might have been. It was diplomacy on the home front that I think escaped, eluded Venizel, or that he willfully ignored, and the, with dire consequences for the Greek state and for the Greek nation. However, for all that, once the, once the disaster had happened, Venizelos, still in exile from Greece, was back in his element as the chief negotiator for his country at Lausanne 100 years ago this year. And with that, I hand back to Michael to take up the concluding part of the story. Thank you. Well, that was a tour de force. Um, it may emerge in discussion later um, what the flaws are in in Roddy's arguments, because there are some. Of course, there are in the arguments which he contested also. Uh, I, I'd like to read a, a quotation which I came across earlier this week, or last week, uh, in the Financial Times by Tim Harford, who's a great uh, correspondent. Um, and he is quoting from War and Peace, Tolstoy. Two quotations. First of all, nothing was ready for the war which everyone expected. <laughs> and the second, what science can there be in a matter in which, as in every practical matter, nothing can be determined and everything depends on innumerable conditions? the significance of which becomes manifest at a particular moment, and no one can tell when that moment will come. That's quite a long quotation, uh, and you know, it, it sums up a lot of what I think about, uh, and obviously Tolstoy thought, about contingency and the difficulty of constructing a history which will stand up to criticism. Um, I'm go now going to take over for the final part of the presentation, uh, but not the final part of the evening by any means, I think, to consider the Lausanne negotiations and some of the characters involved. The Lausanne 
treaty and what led to it, it was a, a very important and very lengthy meeting. And it started from what Roddy was talking about. It started from the failure of Venizelos's Asia Minor policies and the need not just to make up for that failure, but to create a treaty in settlement of the world war, not just Greece and Turkey, the world war in the Middle East, near and Middle East. The exercise was successful. The treaty was successfully concluded between the new independent Turkey of Mustafa Kemal and the various great and lesser powers who had fought against Turkey, Britain, France, Italy, and others, or who were given a place at the table for other reasons. Lausanne was the longest lasting of the treaties. Most of it is still valid. There are some bits which have been overhauled, uh, other bits which have been contested. One thinks about islands and Emir and all that sort of thing. But basically the treaty stands and it, that's fairly rare in international affairs. It pronounced the death rights of the Ottoman Empire, no more Ottoman Empire, and the death rights of the Greek Megali there, the, uh, the great idea. These two things alone show how important Lausanne was, and not just for Greece and Turkey. But of course, it did many other things. It dealt with how the new Turkish state was to engage with the great powers who had fought against it. It also regularized relations between Turkey and Greece, including the frontiers. Frontiers are very important. In fact, Lord Curzon, whom we're going to come on to in a minute, uh, regarded frontiers as the most important ingredient in international affairs, uh, which is quite, a, quite an insight. And Curzon knew a lot about frontiers because he'd traveled all over the Near East and Middle East. It also grappled the Treaty of Lausanne through the Lausanne Convention on the Exchange of Populations with this tragic effect of the Greek defeat, which determined the ethnic and religious constitution of the new Greece and the new Turkey. This convention has been much criticized, but it was well understood, not just by Ismet, the leading negotiator on the Turkish side uh, and a soldier, down-to-earth character, uh, much criticized not just by Ismet, but also by Venizelos himself and, of course, by Nansen, who plays a big part in the Lausanne story because it was Nansen, the great explorer, uh, Arctic explorer, who... Uh, turned up in Constantinople and in Lausanne and was able to set the seal on the negotiation of the convention exchanging the populations of uh, Greeks and Turks. So we can call it the Treaty of Lausanne, I think, if not a success, the least bad solution in the circumstances. I want to stay for a moment on one aspect of the treaty, which I think is interesting and important, and that is the religious aspect. As you know, Lausanne determined that the ecumenical patriarch, the patriarchate, not just the person, should remain in Constantinople, Istanbul. And this was not just a very interesting part of the negotiation, but also a very long one. I believe 
20 out of 26 sessions at Lausanne were devoted uh, in all or in part to the question of the patriarch, the patriarchate, whether it should stay or whether it should go. <coughs> Turkey wanted the patriarchate to be banished from Istanbul. Meletios Metaxakis, the Greek patriarch, controversial, dynamic figure, was in favor of this too, which is, may seem a bit surprising in the light of what happened. Even Venizelos thought seriously about cutting the ties uh, with Turkey and moving the patriarch and the patriarchate to uh, somewhere else, either Thessaloniki or the Holy Mountain. The plus would be to remove the patriarchate from Greek-Turkish controversy. And the minus would be to lose a precious religious institution. Venizelos and his team, in the end, he, he had accepted that the patriarchy should stay. Uh, they won the day with the support of most of the non-Turkish negotiators, backed by international opinion based on religious principles. So the patriarchate remained in Istanbul at the Fana. Uh, and if you are interested in this aspect of Lausanne, uh, the thing to do is to read a wonderful book. It's in Greek, but never mind. Um, it, it's by A. A. Pallis. Alpha Alpha, as his family called him, or others sometimes. Uh, and he has a, a one, terrific description of what was going on at the time of the Lausanne negotiations, including the anger of the patriarch Meletios at the decision finally reached in Lausanne. It's all there in Pallis's book, which is called Xenitemeni Elines, Greeks Abroad. Uh, highly recommended. Now, I'm going to go on to give a few notes on some of the personalities at Lausanne. Perhaps this is a bit lighter than some of what we've been talking about. In the early stages, Curzon, the name has already cropped up, was dominant. He maneuvered himself into a commanding position in the negotiations. Curzon was a very interesting figure, very knowledgeable, uh, very pompous in a way, and he accepted this and he was ready to laugh at himself and stiff-backed. And there was a physical reason for that because he did actually have a, a, a condition of the spine which made it impossible or very, very difficult for him to bend. So that's why he was stiff-backed. There is a, a great book by Harold Nicholson called Curzon, The Last Phase. And the last phase, of course, much of it, is Lausanne. So it, it's relevant to what we're talking about. Nicholson gives a fascinating account of what Curzon did and how he did it. He was interested in the day-to-day -day, um, science, it's not a science, the art of diplomacy. Uh, and he was very successful at it. Bear in mind that he had passed a year or two of acute difficulty in managing the Greek-Turkish issue in its last tragic phase when it was, it turned out to be too late to reach a solution to it. And he'd been sidestepped and sometimes humiliated by his boss, the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. And um, we know what 
Curzon felt about all this because he wrote letters to his wife uh, in which he complained about how the little man, Lloyd George, uh, had pulled a fast one on him again. Of course, he knew the issues which were being debated at Lausanne as probably no one else knew them. Uh, and this was because of his long experience, including in the parts of the world which uh, were concerned. He handled them and the motley collection of negotiators, I won't go through them all, but you know, there were, there were some oddballs there, with great skill. And he had one great advantage, which has been pointed out by the historians. He knew what the Turks were going to do because of the excellence of British intelligence, which told him, so he had on his desk in the morning, an accurate account of what Ismet's uh, negotiating instructions coming from Ankara were going to be. What could one wish for more than that uh, in, a, in a tricky negotiation? So Curzon was a dominant figure, but he th threw it up in the middle and retired hurt, as it were, uh, and never came back. And somebody else had to complete it for him, a career diplomat called Horace Rumbo. Next, there was Venizelos, representing Greece, doughty defender of Greek interests. Curzon didn't like Venizelos very much, but he respected him, and he understood that to reach a reasonable solution to all the problems which cropped up in Lausanne, uh, it, it had to be a balance which recognized the importance of the Greek points of view, we've just heard about the, um, the patriarchate, uh, and the Turkish interests which needed, while important, to be kept under control. So that was Venizelos. Next, Ismet, I've mentioned his name more than once, a soldier, a doughty soldier, representing Turkey, and later he became president of the Republic. I think Curzon had a soft spot for Ismet, although he found him maddeningly slow-footed. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was that Ismet was new to diplomacy and he was nervous, he was frightened that he may, could be upstaged by the bosses back in Ankara by Kemal and others uh, who might pull the, the carpet out from under his feet if he gave too much away in the negotiation. So he didn't give too much away. He negotiated very hard and very long. Um, in the end, however, he, uh, uh, he was accommodated in a fair outcome to the negotiations at, at Lausanne, and credit for that goes to Venizelos, Ismet himself, and of course the rest of the cast, most of whom didn't play all that much of a role. The one who did play a role uh, was, not, uh, was, was not a negotiator at Lausanne, but that was Friedhof, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Nansen, the explorer, the League of Nations representative on the refugee issue, because it was he who put together, the, uh, with the help of Venizelos and Ismet, a deal allowing for the exchange of populations. Much criticized exchange, people um, hate the idea of it because it was made compulsory, but uh, Nansen and Venizelos 
and Ismet all recognized that it had to be uh, compulsory or it wouldn't have worked. Next character in this um, rather bizarre collection of people is Benito Mussolini. Mussolini made what was really his first appearance on the international stage as opposed to uh, being in Italy and uh, skirmishing uh, with, uh, with colleagues and, um, and enemies. And he played his appearance here for all it was worth. He strutted around Lausanne, upstaging the others, but contributing absolutely nothing to the negotiations, which he very, very soon left. Perhaps more on him later. And let me end by referring to something crucial to Greek history. Uh, Roddy Beaton has already referred to it. It's very important. And that is the so-called trial of the six. That is the trial of uh, five politicians and one soldier. Uh, Dimitris Gunaris, the leading politician, and his colleagues, three of whom had been prime minister and one hadn't, uh, and uh, his colleagues and the soldier, General Hatsianestis. I mention this because it coincided with the Lausanne negotiations. I mean, everything happened very fast. Uh, the Asia Minor disaster, the revolution of uh, Colonel Plastiras and Colonel Gonatas and others, uh, the trial of the six, which was organized by a character called Pangalos, who was also a soldier and who had a nephew who was a close uh, uh, colleague of mine, I wouldn't say friend, but you know, he was a, a very lively fellow uh, when I was ambassador in Athens. The trial of the six um, took place at Gouvi, just outside Athens, and was conducted by revengeful soldiers led by Pangalos. From a legal point of view, it was a farce. It was quite clear that the, um, the charges against these six men could not stand up. But that didn't really matter from the point of view of a large public out there and of the army, the Greek army, and of the revolutionaries who presided at that time, it was a necessary purgation, if you like, of the shame incurred by the army from <coughs> losing Asia Minor. Now this, and there's another reason why I mentioned it. This also interested Curzon because Curzon had negotiated with Gunaris, the former prime minister. He had tried to negotiate a way out of the impasse in Asia Minor, but that proved impossible. However, he got to know some of these people, and particularly Gunaris, the prime minister himself. He was shocked. I think genuinely shocked when these men with whom he had been negotiating were condemned to death by the revolutionary government as traitors. As I said, the verdict was absurd, but there it was. It was understandable in the circumstances. Curzon interceded with Venizelos on this issue. He nobbled Venizelos in a, a break in the 
negotiations in Lausanne. And he said, look, what's going on? Um, you should not execute these men. Uh, they are politicians. They are not guilty of the, I don't know how far he went into detail, um, and lay off them. And uh, Curzon went back to his rooms and wrote a letter uh, to Venizelos. And in the letter, oh, sorry, I've, I've got it wrong. He, he spoke to Venizelos and urged him to intercede with his colleagues back in Athens and ensure that these men were not executed. The letter which Venizelos sent recording his discussion with Curzon arrived too late. By that time, the six men had been executed. Uh, not surprisingly, people have, uh, have wondered whether it was sort of deliberately too late or what was, what was the reason behind it. I don't think it was deliberate. But uh, anyway, it was too late, and the six men were executed. That brings me to, very nearly to the end, you'll be glad to hear, to mention another bit player in all these events, and that was Ernest Hemingway, who turned up in Constantinople, Istanbul, and in Lausanne, and exercised his caustic wit at the expense of some of the characters I've described. His early works, he was still a young man, touch on the Greek evacuation of Thrace. There's a, some very moving uh, words which he wrote at that time. He was writing for the Toronto Star. And... Um, on the characters of some of the negotiators at Lausanne and on the trial of the six, he has a little paragraph about how the six men were dragged out and uh, Gunaris, who had typhus, typhus fever at the time, couldn't stand up, so he collapsed in the, in the water. Now, all of this, none of this came from Hemingway through being there but he'd picked it all up, it was in the newspapers and so on. He wrote a poem, and I don't know how we're doing for time, but um, I, I could even read it out to you, if, if that's acceptable to the guys. Um, it's, it's not a good poem, but it does sum up some of the things that uh, Hemingway in his rather obscure way, wanted to say about Lausanne. And it's called, They All Made Peace. What is peace? And here it is. All of the Turks are gentlemen, and Ismet Pasha is a little deaf. I didn't mention, but Ismet was deaf, and he used his deafness as a negotiating weapon very effectively. Uh, he, he, if he didn't want to answer, he sort of fiddled with his hearing aid and uh, didn't answer. The Armenians. How about the Armenians? Well, the Armenians. Lord Curzon likes young boys. There's absolutely no evidence for this, so far as I know, but some, somebody will correct me. Lord Curzon likes young boys. So does Chicharin. Chicharin was somebody who turned up at these negotiations on behalf of the Russians. So does Mustafa Kemal. He's good-looking, too. His eyes are too close together, but he makes war. That is the way he is. Lord Curzon does not love Chicharin. Not at all. His beard trickles and his hands are cold. He thinks all the time. Lord Curzon thinks too, 
but he is much taller and he goes to St. Moritz. Mr. Child does not wear a hat. Mr. Child was the American ambassador who had been sent from some other country to represent the United States who were involved, but uh, they had never declared war on Turkey. So they were in a sort of rather different position. Mr. Child does not wear a hat. Baron Hayashi, the Jap, Japanese, uh, he was there too. Um, surprisingly, you may think, but not so. Baron Hayashi gets in and out of the automobile. Monsieur Barrer, he was the Frenchman, gets telegrams. So does Marquis Garoni, an Italian. His telegrams come on motorcycles from Mussolini, in capital letters. Mussolini has nigger eyes, apologies for incorrect usage, and a bodyguard, and has his picture taken reading a book upside down. <laughs> Mussolini is wonderful. Read the Daily Mail. I used to know Mussolini. This now is... Um, uh, is Hemingway speaking again. Nobody liked him then. Even I didn't like him. He was a bad character. Ask Monsieur Barrer. We all drink cocktails. Is it too early to have a cocktail? How about a drink, George? Come on, we'll have a cocktail. Admiral, just time before lunch. Well, what if we do? Not too dry. Well, what do you boys know this morning? Oh, the shrewd, oh, the shrewd. Mr. Stambuliski, a distinguished presence at the Lausanne negotiations. Uh, Mr. Stambuliski walks up the hill and down the hill. Don't talk about Mr. Venizelos. He is wicked, you can see it. His beard shows it. Mr. Child is not wicked. Mrs. Child has flat breasts, and Mr. Child is an idealist and wrote Harding's campaign speeches and calls Senator Beveridge Al. You know me, Al. Lincoln Steffens is with Child. The big C makes the joke easy. Then there is Mosul. I didn't mention Mosul, but it was a crucial factor in the Lausanne negotiations. And the Greek patriarch. What about the Greek patriarch? That's the poem. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>